it's helpful that after the procedure that the oncology nurse just educates again the family and the patient i think oftentimes people think this is just a radiology procedure that is rather benign that's really the role of the oncology nurse just to be a support emotional support and a coach you're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Manager of Oncology Nursing Practice at ONS. And today we're talking with Lisa Parks, Nurse Practitioner in Hepatobiliary Surgery at the James Cancer Hospital and Solo Research Institute at The Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center in Columbus, Ohio, about what oncology nurses should know about transarterial chemoembolization administration and their role surrounding that procedure. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. I truly appreciate this opportunity to talk about a subject that I have been very grateful to have worked in this area for 18 years and very familiar with the changes that have gone on in the field of transarterial chemoembolization, and I will try to highlight those today for you. Wonderful. Well, that was my first thought. I am in my 17th year of oncology nursing, and I don't know anything about transarterial chemoembolization. I'm okay. I'm not afraid to admit that because it is very specialized. And if you are subspecialized in a field that doesn't refer to that procedure or doesn't include that as part of the treatment plan, then it's likely that there are many oncology nurses that know very little or nothing at all about this specific type of administration. So I'm excited to learn more, and I'm sure you'll share lots of information for both me and our listeners to be able to at least fill what is probably a little black hole of information right now. So to start with that, can you define what transarterial chemoembolization, which is often abbreviated as TACE, T-A-C-E, and is very much easier to say, what is it and which cancers usually have this procedure as part of the treatment plan? Well, I want to start off by saying that historically, TACE, T-A-C-E, was treated, planned for a number of cancers. And as it has evolved over at least the past 10 years, we have seen it now become differentiated into TACE, which uses chemo in the embolization spheres as well as TAY, which takes the chemotherapy out of those spheres for different kinds of cancers. So TACE was commonly used to treat liver metastatic cancers, primarily metastatic colon cancer, until research showed that some of these cancers were not responding to TACE. Therefore, it is no longer really used in metastatic colon cancer. TACE is used in hepatocellular cancer. It also was used more than 10 years ago to treat metastatic neuroendocrine cancers. But recent research has showed that neuroendocrine cancers respond to this embolization without the use of chemotherapy. By eliminating chemotherapy, we also eliminate the potential for side effects. Hepatocellular cancer uses TACE as a local regional therapy. So this therapy is utilized if the tumor is greater than five centimeters or there are multiple large tumors, making surgical resection not a possibility. There are some chemotherapies that can be used to treat hepatocellular carcinoma But oftentimes, patients will not want to undergo chemotherapy or they have tried chemotherapy and it has not been responsive to the chemotherapy. Then this TACE procedure will be utilized as a treatment and it is in the NCCN guidelines. 
Neuroendocrine cancers include cells of the GI tract, islet cells of the pancreas, and bronchial cells of the lungs. Small bowel and pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinomas and the pancreatic neuroendocrines you may see abbreviated as a small p and capital N-E-T, these represent about half of all of the neuroendocrine carcinomas. And the majority of these tumors have distant metastasis at the time of diagnosis, which is usually liver involvement. And this is recognized therapy by the NCCN as a category 2B therapy. Taser Tay is usually completed more than once in the course of a patient's treatment. Depending on the tumor burden of the liver, the procedure can be segmentally completed on a liver lobe, or you can do the procedure on the right lobe and then follow up treatment in about six weeks in the left lobe. Something I, I need clarity on is transarterial chemoembolization. How is that different, or is it different? from just transarterial chemotherapy administration. Are there differences in those two approaches? Is it just a matter of the agents that are used or are those things just the same? In the transarterial chemoembolization, there are microspheres that actually do the embolization. And these microspheres are soaked in chemotherapy, typically doxorubicin, and they soak for about 24 hours, and then they are inserted through the femoral artery up into the liver and then are directed in a vessel that directly gives a blood supply to the tumor. And then those chemo-soaked embolization fears are then released into that blood vessel. So it works by direct chemotherapy, not systemic, and it works by cutting off the blood supply to the tumor, causing tumor necrosis. Thank you for that clarity for me. About this type of chemo administration, the TACE procedure, are there any contraindications or comorbidities that would limit a candidate's appropriateness for receiving TACE? With TACE or TAY, contraindications include severe cytopenia, renal impairment, cardiac impairment, or hepatic dysfunction, which includes cirrhosis. Patients also should have an ECOG status of zero to two. And just like with chemotherapy, administration requires a total bilirubin be less than two. Portal vein thrombosis is an absolute contraindication since the blood supply is already compromised due to the portal vein obstruction. Taste will further compromise arterial supply, potentially resulting in hepatic infarction or acute hepatic failure. The portal vein supplies 75% of the liver and the normal tissue, whereas the hepatic artery supplies 25% of the liver and associated cancer cells. When we're in the treatment planning phase, are there, aside from those contraindications, or comorbidities, what other factors would influence planning for this tumor embolization treatment? So most institutions that perform this procedure have tumor boards that review potential patients for embolizations. For our hepatocellular patients, this will include hepatologists, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, and interventional radiologists. In neuroendocrine, it will not include a hepatologist, but will include gastroenterologist, and then all of the other specialties that I mentioned previously. All pathology reports, treatment plans, and imaging is reviewed and discussed with all members of the tumor board, and a decision is then presented regarding further recommended treatment for the patient. In this treatment plan, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the tumor burden, If the tumor burden, say, is large in the right lobe and there will not be enough surviving normal remnant liver tissue, which could cause potential liver failure if the entire tumor in the right lobe was embolized, they will do what they call super selective. And this will be part of the treatment plan where they will take out 
different branches that feed that tumor over a period of time. And in my institution, we really do not perform a repeat T or TACE sooner than six weeks of time. That allows the patient to go back and see their medical oncologist get imaging done again, usually a CT scan, and then determine whether it was effective treatment or not before they're sent back to interventional radiology to have another treatment performed. Now, it's really interesting because it does, as I listened to your response, you know, it does strike me that it is a very delicate balance between specifically targeting the blood supply and the tumor that you're after, but being careful not to be so effective that you potentially damage the healthy liver that your body needs to stay alive and and do all of its normal functions. And so depending on the size of the tumor that's being targeted, that is a delicate balance. You can't necessarily go in and just completely eradicate it if that would compromise the overall liver function and cause a whole other very serious problem of liver failure. So it does strike me as a very serious, very precise type of procedure. It absolutely is. And I have seen situations over the years as we've learned how to be more cognizant of liver remnant tissue that is still functional, better outcomes in these patients. I think initially when we started doing TAFE, there wasn't the thought so much the remaining liver remnant and these people could go into liver failure, which is certainly not the outcome that you want after this procedure. So for many nurses like myself who know that this isn't a procedure, TACE exists, but we know a little beyond just a referral perhaps to get this procedure done. Can you walk us through just the procedure itself from start to finish? How does it get performed? What types of access devices are used and what types of chemotherapy agents are typically administered? So first of all, I want to clarify this is not a surgical procedure. Because I oftentimes will have patients come into the hospital and think they're having surgery. This is an interventional radiology procedure. And the patient is taken down to the interventional radiology suite. They are given a light conscious sedation. And then the femoral artery is accessed. And then using contrast dye, the interventional radiologist will thread this catheter, as I said, up into the liver through the hepatic artery, and then will target the tumor. And like I said before, depending on the tumor burden, maybe it could be just one tumor that is targeted per procedure. They will find that tumor, and then They will use those chemotherapy-soaked embolization beads that are soaked with doxyrubicin or cisplatin, and they will go ahead and release those embolization beads into that specific artery. And then once they are released there, that catheter is then removed from the body through the femoral artery. We use a MINX, M-I-N, YX device, which seals that site on the femoral puncture site to prevent any further development of a pseudoaneurysm or any kind of bleeding. So then the patient is taken after this procedure to a recovery suite within the interventional radiology suite before they would come back to the general nursing floor. So when they do come back to post-op, whether they are it's a short stay or they stay overnight or perhaps they go home same day, what are some of those post-procedure side effects or complications that we're watching for? Well, as oncology nurses, it's really important to understand that there is something called post-embolic syndrome. And I work in an academic center that has surgical oncology fellows and residents. And this is something that isn't even really taught in medical school. So it's really important to understand that even though this is a post-procedural side effect, there are certain things that you have to be aware of. So the most common side effect that you will see is right upper quadrant pain. And this is very common And if the left side of the liver has received the therapy, 
this pain can radiate to the epigastric area and the patient will describe it as chest pain. And when you have the patient point to that area where he's having pain, it's often epigastric and it's just a referred pain. It's not cardiac pain typically. You can get an EKG intraponin, but those are almost always negative and it's just really part of this embolization syndrome. They can have persistent nausea, vomiting. This can last for several weeks after the procedure, and this again is normal. They can have a transient fever. It is usually no greater than 102 and transient, and then it's usually within the first 48 hours after the procedure. Because you've embolized the liver, there are elevated transaminases, and this is attributed to tumor ischemia and tumor necrosis. We do also see transient hypertension that tends to last for about 48 hours after the procedure. This can be treated with intermittent labetalol and hydralazine. However, it really doesn't have much of an effect because this is, again, just the liver's response to this procedure. Of note, though, for patients that have diabetes, normally dexamethasone is given in the interventional radiology suite to decrease inflammation. This can lead to severe hyperglycemia after the procedure. So these patients may require additional insulin or often an insulin drip. So the nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, again, lasts for several weeks. And so the patient is going to be discharged on antiemetics and opioids. But severe complications that we're looking for immediately post is, of course, liver failure based on liver function test. Liver abscess normally takes about two to four weeks to develop. So these may be patients who are at least two weeks out from the procedure who may present to the emergency room with um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. And you can also, again, have a hematoma at the femoral puncture site or a pseudoaneurysm at the puncture site. But that you normally pick up immediately post-procedure. As far as what the oncology nurse needs to really be aware of, pre-taste or pre tay I just want to emphasize the importance of patient education. The patient and their family need to understand, again, it's not a surgery, it's a radiology procedure, and that the patient is going to have abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting that will last for several weeks. And that is why they are not kept in the hospital for three weeks until these symptoms dissipate. Oftentimes, these symptoms will be present until they get re-imaged at the medical oncologist, and then it's time for them to come back and maybe get another phase of their procedure that they are supposed to have as part of their treatment plan. Nurses after the procedure must really educate the patient to hydrate themselves. They need to keep down about eight ounces of water over a two-hour period. We're not really concerned if they lose their appetite and are not eating like they normally would at home because they can use protein supplements if they don't have any kind of appetite. We do advise them to alternate with ibuprofen and a narcotic to help with inflammation and pain. We also ask they call their provider if they are unable to eat or drink, if they have a fever greater than 101.5, uncontrolled abdominal pain. It's helpful that after the procedure that the oncology nurse just educates, again, the family and the patient. I think oftentimes people think this is just a radiology procedure that is rather benign. So they're very shocked that they continue to be ill over a period of time. I do want to let you know, though, that patients that have a significant spike of their transaminases, over a 1,000, 
those patients are a great concern of going into liver failure. So the nurses need to let the patient know that they will be monitored and kept in the hospital until we start to see a downtrend in those transaminases before they will be discharged. So clearly, as you said, it seems maybe on the surface, a relatively simple procedure. I say that in air quotes because we know that's not simple, but it is something that is done with regularity by those professionals in IR. But clearly, there's still opportunity for side effects, for complications, things that oncology nurses need to be you know, actively monitoring for as they see these patients back in their likely medical oncology clinics following procedure. And so you've given us some ideas of this, but just to make sure that we summarize comprehensively, can you speak again just about how oncology nurses, though they aren't directly in the procedure administering this treatment, how are they involved in the TACE procedure before, during, after? You know, What are the main points that oncology nurses need to take home in terms of knowing what their role is and what their focus should be, even though this procedure happens sort of outside of their control? I think as an oncology nurse in medical oncology, education, 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 also being able to triage these patients on the phone, talking them through how to keep themselves hydrated. We don't recommend plain water. We usually recommend some sort of sports drink that has electrolytes in it. Again, not so much that if the family's concerned they're not eating, that's okay. They can just drink a protein shake and we recommend, you know, three protein shakes a day until their appetite starts to return. And then just being able to have them alternate non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with the opioids. And to keep moving, I've actually had patients that go to bed and stay in bed and just take narcotics. Obviously, they end up back in the hospital with dehydration and failure to thrive. So I just think it's really a coaching job of the oncology nurse, a lot of reassurance, a lot of suggestions on how to get through this very uncomfortable, difficult procedure. I like what you mentioned about that triage and that access for patients. Most of my practice was in outpatient care and that sort of coordination navigation role. It is critical to not only be available, but for patients to understand what are the ways that they can get in contact with their care team when they are home and how can they get those questions answered and what is the best, not only during office hours, of course, but after clinic hours. And so reinforcing how to get in touch with the team And again, just being available to respond to those calls or return those voicemails if you can't answer the call live is really important to provide that support and that coaching to patients as they're going through this post-procedure kind of recovery period. Absolutely. That's really the role of the oncology nurse, just to be a support, emotional support, and a coach. Now, you mentioned a lot about patient education, so you've touched on some of the things to emphasize. Are there any specific resources that you would refer either you know, nurses to use with their patients or how patients go to directly? Are there any good resources that you can recommend? Unfortunately, as you said at the beginning of our conversation, this is just not something that you can find a lot of resource information on. Most facilities that perform this procedure do have their own patient education that they have developed for this. But as far as for oncology nurses, I really think most of what I have seen as far as resources has been published in ONS's Clinical Journal of Oncology Nursing, Oncology Nursing Forum. I don't really see a lot written about this in books. I do write a lot of book chapters. And I really don't see this included in a lot of oncology nursing books. I encourage people to maybe within their institution, if they're interested in learning more about it, to talk more with their medical oncologist, talk more with their interventional radiologist who may be able to help educate them and to constantly be looking at research. As I talked at the beginning, All cancers 
18 years ago included the chemotherapy piece to this. Now we've seen that some cancers respond to just the embolization alone without the chemotherapy. So constantly, I think oncology nursing is such a great profession because it's always evolving. Nurses just need to constantly be on the lookout for new ways that things are done, new treatments, things like that. I really like your recommendation for connecting with the teams at your hospital. If your hospital performs this, which I'm guessing it's likely this is only done at maybe larger academic type institutions is likely not something that maybe every community or regional hospital performs, though I'm sure it's possible. So I think, like you said, it is important to connect with those teams that are doing that procedure so that you can learn more so that you can then educate your patients accurately with the correct information. So I think that is a great idea of creating those relationships with the teams that are doing this procedure for your patients so that you can have clear understanding of what your patient will experience and you can provide consistent education and reinforcement of that education that they will likely also maybe get from their interventional radiology team just so that that messaging again remains accurate and consistent across whatever department our patient is traveling. That's a great recommendation of just making those connections and relationships internally with the teams that are doing that. And if you are at a site that doesn't have that, but you know it's the next town over at the larger hospital, you can still reach out to them. You can still make those connections, ask those questions, maybe set up a a quick, um, you know, webinars and things these days. Maybe you can ask them to do a quick presentation to provide that education to your department or your team so that everybody you know is informed and you don't end up like me 17 years in and, st- and still not sure well, you know details about this presentation. I think the more we can learn about all of the ways that oncology care is changing, even if it's not something that our patient population is doing, you know, receiving frequently, or maybe they're not at all if we're subspecialized in an area that just won't ever use taste, perhaps. It's still a great way to keep well-rounded in, as you said, in staying up to date on what is happening in the field, how are things changing, and who knows, someday maybe taste will come into whatever your subspecialized area is, and you'll be ahead of the game because you've taken that step to just be informed and be aware of what's going on. Absolutely, because I want to say being a uh, tertiary care center in the Comprehensive Cancer Network, a lot of these patients may show up in your local ER because they've been referred to a tertiary care center, but they live in a small community. So they may show up in the emergency room and all of these symptoms they're having may be normal post-embolic syndrome symptoms. So I think it's important to belong to your chapter. That was what was coming to mind when you were talking. Belonging to your chapter, maybe you don't at your hospital or institution perform this procedure, but maybe another hospital within your local ONS chapter does, and maybe inviting speakers to come and do presentations also would be helpful. I do want to mention a couple other things. I want it to be clear that if you're doing local regional therapy, taste or tay, this is considered a palliative procedure. You are not going to get a cure with this treatment. In this situation, neuroendocrine carcinoma, it's already metastatic if you're treating the liver. And with hepatocellular, again, it's still palliative because you're not doing a surgical resection on this patient. And every taste experience for every patient, I've had patients that have had six of these procedures, every experience they get is different. And so maybe they breeze through the first one and the second time, maybe they really, really struggle. So again, going back to that bedside oncology nurse, that nurse in the medical oncology clinic, really being able to be the emotional support and the coach for these patients to get them through the procedure. Thank you so much, Lisa, for those great additional comments and tips of just providing some context for how this procedure will be experienced by patients and then how it fits into their overall intent for their treatment plan. And thank you for all the great information that you shared today. I certainly, while clearly no expert still, at least I can say I know a little bit a little bit about this now and not completely uh, void of any information to inform this. So thank you so much for all the great expertise that you shared with us today. 
Before we end our episode, I do like to ask just a few quick fire questions to help summarize what we've talked about. To start things off, what are some common misconceptions about taste administration? Again, I think what I said earlier is that it's not curative. If anybody thinks that they're going to have this procedure and their cancer is going to be gone, yes, we can necrose the tumor, but it doesn't mean that the patient has no evidence of disease. These tumors do recur very frequently, very rapidly. So we're just really trying to, in a neuroendocrine patient, maybe decrease their symptoms because when the cancer metastasize to the liver, they will often have very severe side effects like flushing 20 or more times a day, 20 or more diarrhea episodes a day. They may get some respiratory issues with wheezing, that sort of thing. And so we're treating their symptoms. In hepatocellular carcinoma, again, it's not a curative procedure. We're just trying to decrease the tumor burden in the liver to allow more functional, normal liver tissue to be present. That's important to reinforce. And again, a piece that oncology nurses can help to provide that education or sort of redirect patients if they feel like there's a misunderstanding of the intent. So that's a very important misconception that oncology nurses are aware of. What's something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? I think this is an evolving topic. As I said, 18 years ago, we used the chemotherapy beads with every embolization that we did. And then we found that colorectal cancer metastasis did not respond to a taste. We found we could take the chemotherapy out of the embolization beads in neuroendocrine carcinoma and get the same results and not have any potential side effects from the chemotherapy in those patients. So I see this as an area that continues to evolve. And I think, again, just keeping your ear to the ground and being aware that new treatment protocols may be coming up in the near future as clinical trials are completed. And what additional training or education would you recommend for oncology nurses if they want to learn more about TACE? At our institution, as you mentioned earlier, this can be a complete outpatient procedure in some of our comprehensive cancer centers where they come in in the morning and they are recovered and then they go home. We do a 23-hour OBS at my facility, so they are admitted to our floor. That allows the advanced practice provider to look over all the labs to make sure that all of our labs are within normal limits to complete this procedure. If we have somebody who comes in and their uh, liver function tests are completely not within a normal limit to receive this therapy, then we cancel the treatment and send the patient home. But when the patient comes back to our floor after having the treatment, it's just very important for those nurses to know the abnormal normal, to know that some of the things that they're seeing, the hypertension, the severe pain, the severe nausea is actually normal and the provider will work with them to try to come up with a regimen that will make the patient as comfortable as possible. I think that's really important, just knowing that your parameters of what's acceptable or what's okay or expected will be different post-procedure versus somebody who is an inpatient for a different procedure or something else. Like the parameters and those uh, sort of normal values will look different. And so that is an important point to understand if you are on one of those floors who are taking care of post-procedures, patients who have received the taste procedure, it's important to understand kind of what to expect but also what to escalate to the provider who is overseeing those patients. Correct. And we do do a lot of education through different PowerPoints. We also have online training for oncology nurses that maybe work off shifts or weekend shifts that can go online and access these educational materials. And we talked about this a little bit already, but are there any other additional resources 
that you would recommend for patients or for providers who just want to learn more? I think, again, being very involved with ONS has really benefited me to have access to both written and oral material presented on this topic. I think there's sometimes a misconception that physicians don't want to be bothered or they're too busy to educate oncology nurses. And I find that that's not necessarily true, that they're very excited that people are excited and want to learn more about their area of expertise. So I encourage people, like you said earlier, to reach out and maybe request somebody come to one of your chapter meetings. Well, I think that's a wonderful idea to end on. Thank you again so much today, Lisa, for joining us today and just sharing all of your information and experience that you have on this very unique and specific topic. Do you have any final comments to share with our listeners? Yes, I appreciate very much being given this opportunity to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to me. I really thank everybody for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.